Colossians chapter 3. And to sort of reset the context, I'm going to start in verse 1, and we'll read verse 1 through 17, and we're going to focus today as we have come through this chapter on verses 12 through 17. The Paul the Apostle writing to the church says in verse 1 of chapter 3, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things of earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you also once walked when you lived in them. But now you must also put off all these, anger, ma wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, uncircumcised nor, or circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another, if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Christian, did you push the button over there? Thank you, son. Unfortunately, many Christians, perhaps many that we know, perhaps we have been guilty from time to time of this ourselves, but many Christians in the West, many Christians in America, they, or sometimes we, see morality as a Christian elective rather than a Christian imperative. Now, we are familiar with going to school, perhaps going to college, continuing education, and in high school or college, sometimes you can take an elective. You don't have to take it, but it might be good for you to take it. And there's an assortment of different electives that you can choose from. Choose one that fits you, something you're interested in. And so often, Christians, I'm afraid, this is how we see Christian morality. This is how we see the Christian life and how we're to live it, how we're to govern ourselves, the standards by which we are to live. We seem to be under the impression that these standards of morality are elective standards. It's an elective morality. Some Christians are more strict. Some Christians are more loose. But it's all an elective sort of thing. This is not biblical. This is not what we see in the New Testament. In fact, the standards of behavior that we have seen in the book of Colossians, 
first the negatives standards in verses 5 through 11, and then the positives that we'll look at today, verses five, uh, 12 through 17. These are not given to us as electives. They are given to us as imperatives. Let me put it a different way. Perhaps it'll be more clear. These are the commands of the Word of God. These are commandments to live by. These are not things that we are allowed to pick and choose which ones please us, which ones fit into our lifestyle, or in our day, of course, our personality type. Well, I'm just this way. And so we, we rationalize based on our personality type, our, our, our psychological makeup on what we will do, what we will be, how we will act, and what we will excuse rather than get rid of. These are commandments in Colossians chapter 3. What we have here are indeed commands of the Apostle Paul to the Colossian church. But by extension, they are the commands of the Word of God to every church. At the end of chapter 4, Paul will say, Hey, there's a letter circulating that the Laodiceans have. I want you to get that letter. It's probably the letter of Ephesians. I want you to get that letter. I want you to read it yourselves. And I want you to take what I've written you. It's not just for you. I want you to give it to them. Pass it on. Gives us a glimpse sort of how the New Testament began to be copied and circulated through the churches. This is not just the commands of Paul to the Colossian church, but these are the commands of the Word of God to every church. And in essence, they are the commands of Jesus Christ to His followers, to you and me, His disciples. If you have professed Christ, then these commands are for you. We looked last week at the negative commands. We saw three imperatives given to us. Put to death, verse 5. Put off, verse 8. And do not lie, verse 9. All three of these are imperative statements. They're not put to death these things if you feel like it, but put to death these things because you were raised with Christ. And put off these things because you are a Christian. And do not lie to one another because we follow the truth of Christ. And following these imperatives, we also saw two vice lists of five vices each. Lists of evil conduct. Lists of debauched behavior. We saw in verse 5, fornication, uncleanness and impurity, passion, and that is sinful passion, evil desires, desires that have been corrupted by evil. See, the world takes what God has made as good and corrupts it into evil. God gives us right desires and we take those desires and pollute them and pervert them and corrupt them. And then covetousness, which is idolatry. And then he went on further and gave us another list in verse 8. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. So three imperatives of what our life must not have within it, what we must put to death, what we must put off, what we must not do, followed by illustrations of what these things are that we must put to death, what these things are that we must put off. Now the negative commands strike many as so difficult because the temptations of the flesh, they pull us towards those things, do they not? We may admit that the things in verse 5 and the things in verse 8 are evil things. And yet we are tempted by them anyway. In fact, it's not even always a temptation. What about anger and wrath? Usually that's just a reaction and a response. We don't hear the devil saying, do you want to be angry right now? <laughs> we do that all on our own. We hear something that we don't like and we erupt sometimes. The Christian is to tame that volcano, to sense that eruption, and as a Christian, to put Christ first. So, 
we see these ne negative commands and they often seem so difficult to obey and to follow, to live a pure life, to live a decent life. And yet, I suggest to you, the positive commands are no less difficult, no less ominous, no less contrary to our natural state, our natural condition. These positive commands are also given in structure of three imperatives. Put on, verse 12. See, earlier, hey, put off these things. These things need to be stripped from your life. But Christianity is more than what we don't do. It's what we do. It's how we behave. It's the ideals that we seek to live up to. And so there is much positive about the Christian faith, about the commands of Christ. Put on, and we'll look further at what we're to put on. And then let rule. Let the peace of God rule. This is an imperative. It's not, well, you know, if, if you have the psychological nature of calmness, if you're a calm person, if you're a type B rather than a type A, if you're passive rather than aggressive, then let God's peace rule. This is not the case. It sounds like that in English. But this is not the case as Paul wrote it in Greek. It's not allow it, but it's allow it in such a way that this is a command from Christ, from God. He has established peace between you and Him. And you are to allow, you are to bring imperatively that peace into your life. You're not to say, well, that's just not for me. Or I'm just hot-blooded. Or I'm just not a peaceful person. No, as Christians, it's God's peace which must imperatively rule in our hearts. And if it's not ruling there, here's the imperative. Make it rule there. <laughs> you, you have held back from God. He's obviously not reigning in your life if you're trying to excuse and rationalize these things. And so you must let it rule. Imperative. We must hear it. And so... The second imperative that will, the uh, third rather, is let dwell. Let the word of Christ dwell. But it's imperative. It must dwell. See, as Christians, as regenerate people, as, as, as those who have been renewed by God, we have new cravings. And Peter talks about this craving we have for the word of God. It's like milk to us. It nourishes us. We need it. We seek it. We're after it. It's a command. We must have the word of Christ dwelling in our hearts so that it might do its good work in our lives. That implanted word, as James calls it, must be allowed to grow and to take over so that we are governed, not for the, by the vain philosophies of the world that he spoke about in chapter 2, but we are governed by the philosophy of Christ, by the doctrines of God, by the truth of Scripture. This must be part of our life. So we have these three imperatives, and then there's a virtue list. Not just a list of the evil things that we shouldn't do in verses 5 and 8, but here a list, just as the others were of five, this is also of five, a list of five virtuous behaviors virtuous ways of living, virtuous behaviors. And what a contrast. Could it be any more stark? It is the difference between the light and the darkness, between good and evil, between God and his Christ and the devil and his minions. I mean, just look at the difference. Tender mercies. The world is not a merciful place. But the Christian church is to be a place full of tenderness and full of merciful compassion. Kindness. Kindness. Like that good Samaritan who was kind to the stranger. To the Jewish stranger who, if all things were equal and he wasn't laying in a ditch, on the way to Jericho, he would have probably despised that Samaritan because the Jews and the Samaritans did not have dealings with one another 
There was a racial divide. And yet in Christ, isn't that what we saw in verse 11? Those racial divides melt away. We are one in Christ. There's no male, there's no female. The gender war is over. There, there's no uh, Greek or Jew. The racial lines are blurred. We're all one in Christ. He is all and in all. Kindness. Kindness across gender, across race, across economic statuses. Humbleness of mind. See, if you look back on those vice lists in verse 5 and 8, it's about exploiting people for your own pleasure. And it's about abusing people. And yet here, there's a humility of mind. There's a humbleness of mind. I esteem others higher than myself. And so I'm not after people to exploit them and use them and abuse them. Rather, I, I see myself as one who is to be of service to those around me. Meekness, in some translations, gentleness, and long-suffering, patience. See, isn't th aren't those the things, specifically gentleness and long-suffering, don't you need those to combat that sense of anger, that feeling of wrath? When, when that filthy word and thought is about to come flowing forth from your tongue, aren't these the things that would hold them back and restrain them? As the Holy Spirit produces these things in our lives, it has a radical effect on how we live. Paul says we used to walk like that in verse 7. We used to walk in those evil behaviors. But the Holy Spirit now has created us as new creatures. And we are, as verse 12 says, the elect of God. We're holy. We've been set apart by Him and we're loved by Him. Now, His commands, the negative, the positive, His commandments to the Christian, to the lover of God, these commandments are not a burden. They're not burdensome to those who have the love of God reigning in their hearts, as John says in his first letter, chapter 5, verse 3. His commandments are not a burden to us. And if we would review John, 1 John, we would see some important statements regarding the commandments of God. In 1 John, chapter 2, verse 3, the beloved apostle says, now by this we know that we know him. You want to be confident of your relationship with God that you truly know him? Here's how we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. One of the first things I taught my sons as we would talk about the scriptures is I would tell them that Jesus said, if you love me, then you will obey me. And as their father, I would try to develop that with them. I'm your father, I love you. And if you love me, you'll obey the things that I say. This is the relationship that the Lord wants to foster with his children. In, in the next verse of chapter two, in verse four, John says, now he who says, I know him, I know God, but does not keep his commandments, that person's a liar. The truth is not in that person. You can't say, I know the Lord, I know God, I, I am a believer in Christ, and yet his commandments have no place in your life. John says in chapter 3, verse 22, And whatever we ask, we receive from him, because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Now, there's a lot here about our prayer life that I find fascinating. But suffice to say, we want to please him. If we are his children, renewed by his spirit, born again, then we're like Jesus, right? Jesus said, I always do those things which please my father. And so if we are following in the steps of Christ, that's our motto. That's our mode of operation. This is how we live. I want to please my father. John says in chapter 3, verse 24, now he who keeps his commandments abides in him, and he in him. 
and by this we know that he abides in us, by the Spirit whom he has given us. So, you can tell a true Christian because as Jesus said, you can know them by their fruits. Is it good fruit, righteous fruit, godly fruit, Christian fruit, spiritual fruit, or is it fleshly and carnal and evil and bad and rotten and corrupted? A good tree can't produce bad fruit, and a bad tree can't produce good fruit. You will know them by their fruits. Like we said in our last study, we must make our calling and election sure. If somehow the commandments of God are not abiding in us and we in them, beware. He says in chapter 5, verse 2, by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep His commandments. So, the point is, His commandments have a right place in our life. They are imperative commandments. Things that have no place in our life, we must put off and things that must have a place in our life that we must put on. Christian apparel. It's the apparel of a Christian. My dear Jenna Marie, when she finds someone on YouTube or on TikTok that she likes, she wants to get that merch. Oh yes, that blessed merch. She wants to get that hoodie with the little logo or whatever it is. She wants to identify with those that she loves. Christian apparel is like that. We put on the character of Christ. We want to be identified with Christ. We, we want to put on Christ. We want to identify and be identified as a Christian in all that we do. And so, this is the Christian's moral apparel. It's not an elective, it's an imperative. But, it's an imperative that is within us supernaturally motivated. Once the Spirit has made us new, we want to put off those evil things and we want to put on the right things. We want to be, we want to have that moral apparel that reflects rightly and good on our Savior. So, notice Verse 1 of chapter 3 of Colossians, verse 5 of chapter 3, and verse 12. They all begin with therefore, or something of that nature. There's a Greek word underlying it, and they all begin with this therefore. Now in verse 1, it says in our New King James, if then, or if therefore, you were raised with Christ, this calls attention to the preceding doctrine, chapter 1, chapter 2. And it's as if the apostle is saying, in light of our complete salvation in Jesus Christ, and due to our full access to God through Him, therefore, if you were raised with Christ, Seek those things which are above where Christ is. So the doctrine gives way to duty. The position gives way to practice. If we are His, then we should be seeking Him. So we hear the doctrine. I'm complete in Christ. I don't need anything else except Christ. I have full access to God. I don't need to worry about what the Judaizers are telling me, what the pagans are bringing my way. I don't need to worry about any external influence that's coming upon me to adjust the gospel, to change the gospel, to pervert the gospel. I'm complete in Christ. I have full access to God. And because of that, I will be busy seeking Him and seeking the things above where he is sitting at the right hand of God. Now, in verse 5 and 12, the therefore functions differently. This term now calls attention to the conduct of those who have been raised with Christ. Therefore, put to death your sinful nature, your members which are on the earth. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on the character of Christ. 
put it on, a commandment. Put it on. Now, you ever look in the mirror and you think something's missing? I need to add something to my wardrobe. The Christian life can be like that. We might be seeking the Lord in prayer or reading through his word, and we might come across something, hmm, this is missing in my life. Now, we don't want to be that guy that James talks about, looks in the mirror, looks in the word of God, sees the problem, but then goes away and forgets what he saw, what he observed. We want to be the kind of person who says, oh, okay, I have a problem here. There's something in the scripture that says Christians shouldn't have this, and instead should have this, and whoa, I got this backwards. <laughs> I have the wrong thing and don't have the right thing. We need to make sure that we allow the Holy Spirit to bring that conviction and to renew us and to make us more like Christ. And so, put on the virtues of Christ is what we see in verse 12. Put it on. Put it on. It's not maybe you should put it on, but put it on. You must put this on if you are one of God's chosen people, one of the elect of God. You must put on these virtues. If you are one of those people that have been set apart by God, you must put on these virtues. If you are one of those that have been beloved by God and have enjoyed His salvation, you must put on these virtues virtues, this Christian moral apparel, the apparel of Christian living. Tender mercies must be part of our life. We must be merciful people. Kindness must be something that flows forth from our heart. Humbleness of mind. When we think everybody else is wrong, we're the only ones who are right, we need to exercise humbleness of mind and meekness, gentleness, and long-suffering. These are not for you only if you have a natural inclination towards such attitudes. But these are things for every Christian, for every single person who claims the name of Jesus Christ. These things must be more and more growing in our life. If these things are part of our life, don't you see how the next thing follows from it in verse 13? See, if we're putting on Christ-like virtues, well, then I might find it possible to bear with you. Right? When there's a complaint against somebody, a complaint against me, or maybe I have a complaint against you. Well, if I have put on these important Christian characteristics then I will find myself learning what it is to bear with people and to forgive them rather than holding grudges against them. Because who is my ultimate example but Jesus Christ? He forgave me, and sometimes we forget we didn't deserve that. Sometimes we forget what grace is all about. I didn't deserve it, and the idea is, Paul's trying to help us here, if you think that person doesn't deserve it, bingo, you're learning. That's why you should forgive them. That's why you should be gracious towards them because they don't deserve it, because you didn't deserve it, and yet God forgave you. So, the next imperative is in verse 15. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Now, we were called to this. We've been called to peace. Throughout the New Testament, the Bible says that Christians are to have peace with one another. We are to live at peace in our communities. We are to be peacemakers. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. We're not to be people of conflict. Now, there is a conflict, isn't there? But it's not against flesh and blood. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but we wage spiritual warfare against principalities in high places, right? So we got to remember where the warfare is to be aimed, where the wrestling match is to be had. It's not to be had in the church among God's people. We're not to be those who roughhouse and knocking each other around and throwing each other down. And we're to be a place of peace. Now, as Paul knew right well, you can read through his letters and find many examples of 
problems, issues, fightings, conflict in the church. Paul is here giving us the ideal. And we're not to be part of the problem, right? We're to be part of the solution. Paul wasn't blind to the fact that often in churches there are conflicts among the members. But neither was he so cynical that he gave up on preaching that Christians should have peace with one another because Jesus said, by your love for each other, everyone will know that you're my people, that you're my disciples. And this is really the source of our thankfulness because we're at peace. We're at peace. No matter what might rile us up in the world, the ultimate problem that we had was that we were not at peace with God. The ultimate problem was that we were destined for hell. That we were one day going to stand before our Creator in our sin. And God has made peace with us through the blood of the cross of His Son, as we saw in chapter 1, as we saw in chapter 2. We have seen the peace that Christ has brought, the reconciliation that He has made. And so we are to extend that peace from ourselves to one another. And we are to be those who are at rest and we are grateful and we are a thankful people. You know, the more gracious we are, the more thankful we are, the more we have gratitude flowing out of our hearts, you'll find that the less you'll have conflict and disappointments and being upset and having those interpersonal issues that so often creep up. And so the third imperative is let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. This is what a wonderful passage this is. I mean, we could do a whole sermon right here. The richness of Christ's Wisdom is to be manifested in and to be manifested by our teaching, our warning, and in our singing. Remember how Paul had said back in chapter 1, verse 28, speaking of Christ, Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. And so here is the wisdom of Christ. We are to have that word dwelling in us richly by our teaching, teaching of the word of God, by our warning. Hey, people need to be warned. The lost need to be warned of hell. Christians sometimes need to be warned of, hey, are you walking in those things we're not supposed to walk in? And are you doing those things we're supposed to do? And singing, part of that is the singing of the Christian church. The word of Christ is to dwell in us as we sing with grace and sincerity in our hearts to the Lord. But notice, what makes all of this possible? We see it in verse 14. What makes it possible to put on the virtues of Christ? What makes it possible for the peace of God to rule in our hearts? What makes it possible for the word of Christ to dwell richly in us? That which holds all these things together is the love of Christ. Verse 14, above all these things put on love, which is, it's the bond, it's that which holds together. It's the bond of maturity and perfection. We will never be mature Christians unless we have the love of Christ reigning us in and ruling over us. And Paul says it, sums it up wonderfully in verse 17, doesn't he? A sweeping statement which covers the whole of our Christian lives. Whatever you do, in word or in deed, your, your, your speaking and your actions, whatever it is, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. What a conclusion. The negatives, the positives, the imperatives, whatever it is, whatever is coming out of your mouth, it must be in the name of Christ. 
Whatever you're doing, let it be in the name of Christ. Let us do everything in the name of Jesus and giving thanks to the Father through him.